Greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is still doing well, and welcome to this night-ending bonus upload. Before we jump into it, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe, it doesn't cost you a cent. Click that like button, takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, folks, they really do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to tonight's night ending bonus upload, shall we? Today's first encounter. I was homeschooled for most of my life, and it was very hard to keep track of time for me at this time, and years often had little distinction for me, with no reason to keep track of time outside of a young child's countdown for important holidays and birthdays. I did not start registering what day of the week it was until I started public school at 15, but I do have clear memories of events I confirmed happened when I was three so I do feel I have a good recollection of this. I grew up on a farm that was sold by my grandmother over five years ago behind our backs to a farmer we rented our fields to after we had been promised the 114 acres my family had been taking care of all of my life. We didn't have much of a structure to our homeschooling, so it was often us doing things we could mark off as educational for the homeschool evaluator at the end of the year, which meant we only had to give her a sample of physical homework, and this my mother rarely had us do, until we needed them close to that evaluation. I say all of this to tell you just how much time I spent in these woods it was my gym, and I could head out and play or walk the woods and stalk or chase after whatever animal I came across all day if I felt like it. I was a stupid kid when it came to wild animals. I once tried to pet an animal I thought was a cat that I had cornered under our back porch step, but looking back, I know it was clearly a raccoon. Glad its hissing told me off, and I didn't stick my hand under there to pet it. There were also coyotes in these woods, but my mom didn't believe this until she heard it from a man she allowed to trap on the property a few years before we were forced to move. I was likely little small to be alone in the woods, as I would see them lined up against the tree line as I cut through the fields watching me sometimes. I swear there were eight all watching me. This one time, I used to run towards the dogs, which, thankfully, simply scared them back into their burrow. As I became older, I never saw these coyotes, which makes me think they were likely looking for a snack. I saw a few animals that were off to me during my walks, and I recorded them in a notebook with other odd experiences sometime after this event. This notebook disappeared when I was 11 or something. The encounter itself happened in full daylight sometime in the early afternoon. I was shooting arrows at a haystack behind the barn. I wasn't with anyone. My dad was working in his shop. These weren't anything sharp, but we still had a good safety practice with them. I practiced so often at this time I honestly was not bad at all. This was a handmade English longbow made to my height so they were quite easy for my child self to pull into position at my cheek. 
I haven't found a modern bow to work as easily, but I didn't learn a lot about those and haven't done anything like that for a long time. I would go back and forth retrieving my arrows, as I only had three if I completely missed the haystack with my spray-painted target. These could go pretty far past them. We had a pasture off to my left connected to the barn and a large field all along my right. When the pasture ended, the field carried on for about twice the distance. The land was bridged together by woods that started after the pasture ended, so I just had a grass clearing far off into the distance where I would search for my painfully natural-looking arrows. As I was retrieving them, I noticed at the end of a far pasture. We had one fenced in with wire, but not usable, so it was just a chicken field. There's a large, sort of bulky, if not muscular-looking dog sitting somewhat oddly. I'm close enough to see its shape quite distinctly, but being fully black, there weren't a lot of details to make out, but I believe it may have had a dog-like snout. As I am pretty convinced I was looking at a dog. My parents didn't have a dog, so curious to see one on the property, I wanted to approach the animal to see if I could befriend it. This seemed perfectly natural at the time. Probably sounds pretty natural still, but I suddenly thought that I didn't notice it until I looked up and it was quite close to me, meaning it might have been sitting there watching me for a potentially long time. Ten or so feet from the corner of the outer fence, it stood beside what was a rather marshy, overgrown grass and green area. It sat there a minute as I began to get even closer to it, and then pushed itself up, no longer sitting. I remember it looked so much taller doing that, like the length of its arms slash front legs were hidden by the black hair and distance. I say arms because this thing started swinging itself into the grass on its knuckles exactly like an ape. I saw it make maybe three of these motions and it was gone. I'm unsure if this animal had a tail or not. I think its movement had disturbed me at the time, but for whatever reason, after walking all the way back to the barn, I simply told my dad I had just saw a dog. I did talk about weird experiences with an acquaintance who lives in the area before, and she was convinced she had seen something like I had described at one point. I don't recall if she ever shared her experience with me, though. I'm thinking this person definitely saw a dog man, and they definitely know they saw a dog man. I don't know how, if it was such a, a grassy, high grassed field they were able to see it running on their knuckles maybe they just envisioned it running on its knuckles how it kind of ran maybe it ran with its front legs together you know moving in unison and then the back legs moving in unison as well um definitely a dog man sighting though especially in pennsylvania today's second experience on the paranormal side. A long time ago, when I was a child of about 11 years old, living on a rural farm, I had a friend, a boy my age. He was the neighbor's grandson. She was a lovely woman who lived down the road. Her property connected to ours, and the end of her driveway was the local school bus stop. I used to visit before school for a cookie and a chat. Sometimes her grandson would visit and we would get up to mischief with a quad bike, and there was also a go-kart that sat in the middle of the garden. Sometimes we would climb the hay barn and sit at the top, but it was the quad we had the most fun with. We would try to make a ramp over the ditch in the front paddock, and probably the most dangerous was a game where we would try to push each other off of the quad while we were driving, taking in turns trying to knock each other off and then racing away while the one pushed off chased after to catch up, and then we'd start all over again. This was very dangerous and kind of stupid, I realize that now, but as a kid, I was invincible, 
and naive, but this was normal with us. Once, we even climbed the giant hill behind my house and raced each other rolling down it. That time, there was a girl with us, too, Melissa. I never saw her again after that, but I digress. The story is about Justin. He was kind of cute with his blonde hair and blue eyes, but I was at the stage where boys are gross, and sometimes he would tease me and make me upset. Now, so far, everything sounds normal, right? Well, this is where things get weird. One day we're hanging out on the upper level of the hay barn, and he was talking about jumping off onto the dirt road below. I tried, He tried to dare me to jump, and I got scared and refused. It was a long way down, and I didn't want to hurt myself. I'd been practicing jumping off the shed roof at home, as this wasn't the first time he had talked about, but that roof was only a quarter of the height and I would land on grass and still hurt myself a bit. Anyway, he started teasing me and calling me names like chicken and making chicken noises. I got really upset and started to cry. He said, don't be such a wuss. I did it, and I'm fine. I called him an idiot as I climbed down. I told him I wasn't playing with him anymore, and I ran home. The next day I went back to his grandmother's to see if he would play with me, but I couldn't find him anywhere, so I knocked on her kitchen door and asked if she had seen him around. The look on her face wasn't one I'd expected. It was a look of shock and sadness, and she asked, How did I know him? Where did I get that name from? I just looked at her confused and said, He's your grandson. She gasped and invited me in, and once I was inside, she handed me a framed photo and asked me if I recognized the boy. I said, of course I did. It was Justin. I was really confused by this point. And so she sat me down at the table and told me the story of how her grandson had died in a terrible accident years before we had even moved to the area. Justin had slipped and fell off of the second level of the hay barn and he had died instantly, snapping his neck. At first I didn't believe her, as I was sure she had seen us around the farm. She said no, she had seen me running around, and quite enjoyed me being there, as it made her remember the fond memories she had of kids running around, and since his death, there just wasn't any kids around. It was at this point I realized that Justin always called out to me when I was walking up the path to visit her, and then I would run off and play with him. We had sat and talked for a while as she wanted to know everything about what we had done. When I told her about the quad bike, she laughed and said he always loved that thing, but it had sat in the shed since the accident and would not run anymore. I also told her about rolling down the hill, but she had no idea who Melissa was. Anyway, it was getting late and I had to go home. As I left, I noticed the go-kart in the garden. It was not shiny red as I remembered it, but a rusted, faded orange with wheels half stuck in the ground, as if it had stopped working years ago. I asked her if that was his, and she said yes. She said she couldn't bear to get rid of it, so she just made it a permanent part of the garden. I never saw Justin after that, but I was always keeping a diary of sorts hidden under a bridge in a waterproof container with a pen, and every now and again I would discover writing that wasn't mine until I had moved out in a hurry and couldn't take it with me. Years later, I was going through my file, and I saw Justin's name along with Melissa's, and my social worker had written that I had a wonderful imagination, and that due to my loneliness and isolation, I had invented them as my imaginary friends, as no children lived anywhere near me. I know they weren't imaginary, as I remember them so vividly, and in the case of Justin, I wasn't the only one who remembered him. Also, how could I play such a dangerous game on the quad by myself? That thing had a cutoff switch 
that would have stopped the moment the driver got off. So how could I chase it unless Justin was driving? And also, how did I know how to drive it? As she stated that it doesn't run. Also, she is a smart, caring woman. She would not have let me do something so dangerous. So where did I go? Where she couldn't have seen me as I was driving around the front paddock only a few meters from her house. So many questions left unanswered, but I do know this. I miss my crazy friend. Okay, so we have this road that leads from our town to a highway that has a McDonald's on it. So we have to go all the way out to the highway when the kids want McDonald's. One evening we had to go and get food and we we're coming back on the same two lane highway. And it had just gotten to where we needed headlights on. We were about a mile down and the truck was coming towards us. We slowed down because my husband and I saw something and it's weird to try and explain. But it was like the size of a wolf. But whatever it was reminded me of the predator when he went invisible. We could see it, but it looked like the road and part of the grass. I had slowed down and I was looking at it, trying to figure out what was going on, and it turned its head towards us because we could see the cloaking thing shift. The truck coming towards us saw it also because it slowed down, and the predator wolf thing shot across, and it just looked nuts. Just like when the predator moved in the movies, how you could see it, but you couldn't. I looked up and watched the driver of the truck watch it, and he was kind of shot up in his seat, and both of our heads shot to the side when it shot off. We all just sat there. We slowly pulled to each other, and I was hesitant to even roll my window down at that point, but thought, well, it's going to go through his truck to get to us first. The driver of the truck said, what was that? Did you see it try and hide what it really looked like by trying to blend in? That's when I knew it really did have a cloaking looking thing going on. We agreed on everything and drove on. The whole time I was watching mirrors and windows waiting for it to attack since we had seen it. Made it home and would not go back out that way for a year. We've talked about it around here before, and a few others have described the same thing before. I even mentioned the predator cloaking thing. What could it be? This is Native American land, and my dad's tribe is who land it is, but I've asked a few elders, and they always say not to ask about things, or they will hear you talking about them and pay you a visit. That's kind of like them saying not to whistle at night, eat in the dark, or leave your hairbrush with hair in it. Just the way we were raised, but I need to know what it was. All right, folks, what a way to end the day off with some just absolutely horrifying experiences. I hope you enjoyed them as much as I enjoyed sharing them with you. I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. It is, after all, your support that keeps this channel growing and going. And honestly, what gives people a place to share their experiences, ideas, and theories, judgment and ridicule free, just simply treated with the respect that we all deserve. Thank you. Everyone stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, and friends. These creatures are real. These scenarios are real. They are out there and they can happen to any one of us. Share this information with the people that you love and care about and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for answers, and God bless.